Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Hamada, and I'm the Director of Industry and Filmmaker Relations at Siren Media. I'm joined here today by Chris Kaplan, a financial coach from Neighborhood Trust, and we're going to talk a bit about how to make sustainable financial decisions as a filmmaker. So to get started, um, Chris is going to share a brief presentation about some of the work that Neighborhood Trust does. All right, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, just waiting for that presentation to come up. Uh, Amrita, should I expect to see it up on my screen? Amrita? She's starting to share right now. Um, oh. Let me know if you don't see it. Um, I'll try again. Sure. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. I'm not sure if I should be, but. Oh, okay. Something is coming up now. All right, great. So Trust Plus, as uh, that opening uh, screen might imply, is an employer-based financial coaching service. Uh, what we basically do is meet with uh, individuals and uh, help them identify certain financial goals, as well as uh, what practical uh, obstacles or challenges might be standing between them and those goals. Uh, we then just try to uh, have a very you know, uh, transparent and casual conversation about what steps they could start taking today in order to uh, implement better financial practices and gain better control over the aspects of their finances that they do have some measure of control over uh, while managing the things that are less flexible or that they don't have as much control over. Uh, could we move on to the next slide? Okay. Awesome, I'm just gonna make this a little bigger so I can see what I'm talking about, okay. Uh, so Trust Plus is a one-on-one -on -one coaching service. Uh, we meet, as I just mentioned, with individuals. Uh, sometimes we may meet with two individuals if a client decides that they wanna bring their partner in on the call if they're tackling some uh, mutual financial goals together, say owning a home or you know starting a new business together. Um, we meet with people all across the nation uh, since uh, Trust Plus launched. Uh, we've scaled, and now we meet with clients uh, all across the country. I'm based out of New York. I have clients here in New York, but I also have clients in Texas and California. Um, we offer our financial coaching service through partnerships with uh, employers, whether it's uh, other nonprofits or uh, companies or corporations. And uh, the service is normally paid for by the employer but comes at no cost to their employees. So uh, the end user uh, normally doesn't have to pay anything for the service. Um, however, given that we're still in the midst of a pandemic, we are making certain concessions. And as of right now, the financial coaching service is available to members of CERN at no cost to you. And uh, finally, I should point out that it is 100% confidential. And as I mentioned, it's free. Uh, we offer our coaching services in both English and Spanish. And they can be conducted over the phone or via video chat using Google Meet or the Zoom platforms. And we can move on to the next slide. So in this slide, uh, it's just a quick overview of some of the uh, common topics that might come up during a conversation with one of our clients. Um, many people are interested in improving their credit. Others uh, may be interested in uh, finding a better way to manage their banking products. Uh, maybe they don't have the best uh, checking account uh, in terms of high financial fees or you know overdraft policies that are uh, a little uh, tough to navigate. Uh, other people may be interested in figuring out a better way to make uh, the most out of the income they have now. Uh, uh, they may be earning a certain income, but for some reason can seem to figure out a way to stop living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so if as you know, that's often a common issue and uh, we often 
uh, begin by helping them uh, take stock of what their spending patterns might consist of, uh, perhaps uh, reviewing their uh, transaction history, if it's easy enough to do so using a, a bank account and using, for instance, uh, Chase's account activity. That'd be one way that we can have an in-depth look at what they're spending over the course of the 30-day period may consist of. And then once we have that sort of insight, we'll take a step back, uh, take a look at what their current budget consists of and help them ask, you know, the right questions. Uh, where can I cut back? Where am I willing to do so? Where am I not willing to do so? Or where can't I not cut back? And then uh, figure out what kind of changes they could begin implementing sooner than later in order to hopefully stop living paycheck to paycheck. And then, of course, we also uh, tackle uh, topics such as retirement. Uh, we could go into some of the different retirement accounts that may be uh, available to you, whether it's a 401k or uh, individual retirement accounts, which are a different type of retirement account uh, offered outside of uh, uh, any sort of employer relationship you may have. And uh, finally, yeah, we, we could definitely help you navigate questions about what may be more cost effective, uh, whether you're considering renting or maybe buying at some point in the future. And we can move on to the next slide. So, uh, yeah, so just another quick recap of what we do. Uh, as I mentioned, we help our clients with budgeting. Um, budgeting can mean uh, different things to different people, and it can look uh, uh, any number of different ways. But the way I typically do it with my clients is uh, we have a formal document where we very simply list what your different income sources might be, uh, whether they're consistent or less so, but whatever those income sources may be. And then we compare them to all of the different expenses you may have to manage. That's basically what we think of when we think of budgets. Um, that is a document that would allow us to collect all of this information in one place uh, and gives you the ability to look at it at a glance and then kind of figure out overall what kind of steps uh, or changes you may begin to make in order to uh, improve our finances. Uh, when it comes to credit and debt, uh, we have a contract with one of the three major credit reporting bureaus. Uh, those are TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. We work with TransUnion to gain access to our clients' uh, TransUnion credit reports. It's a soft pull that wouldn't impact our score, but does give us the visibility we need to make some informed recommendations about how to tackle different issues on their credit reports. Uh, if it's high balances, we can explore debt repayment strategies to help you get out of debt faster and hopefully save you uh, substantial sums of money and interest charges over the long haul. And if there are other issues related to uh, delinquencies, late payments, uh, collection accounts, other forms of negative information that may be dragging down your score, we'd explore all sorts of different solutions depending on what situation you're facing. Uh, in some cases, these negative accounts might be the result of an error, in which case it would make sense to dispute them rather than jump to pay them off in order to improve our credit. But you know, since it's uh, it, it really depends and it's a sort of case by case uh, basis, we'll uh, try to tailor our solutions and our recommendations to our clients' needs. Uh, banking, as I mentioned, we help our clients navigate the banking system. Uh, we evaluate how they're currently using their bank or checking accounts, uh, savings accounts, uh, what sort of fees they might be facing, um, whether they're, you know, suited, uh, whether they're, they're well suited for their needs and, and what they plan on using their, their bank accounts for. In many cases, we may recommend a switch just to save them money on fees. Uh, in other cases, they're, they're just fine, but maybe they have uh, one or two, one or two too many uh, bank accounts, uh, which creates additional moving parts, which can make navigating the banking system and by extension, your finances, uh, that much more complicated. So sometimes it means cutting back on the number of accounts that we have. And finally, savings. Uh, savings is directly related to uh, just about everything else we mentioned. Uh, it's related to budgeting, it's related to the credit and debt, it's related to your banking. Um, it's directly related to budgeting because if one of our goals is to save more money, then 
we would normally begin with a budget in order to figure out how to get to a place where we can save more money. If it doesn't seem as if we have money to save, then we would have to start looking at where the money's going and a budget allows us to do that. Um, it's related to credit and debt because if we have debt that we need to manage, uh, credit card payments, personal loan payments, then these are expenses that may to an extent be getting in the way of your ability to save. If we could figure out a way to get out of debt faster and uh, more effectively more and more cost effectively, then that also gives you uh, more of an opportunity to save more money. And I guess I'll stop there. Uh, we don't sell anything. Yeah, so I was just gonna mention, uh, we don't sell anything. Uh, we're not in the business of promoting certain products over others at the end of the day we're here to help our clients make their you know the best financial decisions for themselves uh, we're not here to collect any sort of commission or you know i don't know uh i forgot the terminology but we're, we're not getting any kickbacks uh we're, we're here for our clients and our only goal is to help them reach their financial goals um that's a picture of our team. I don't think I'm in that particular picture that might have been before my time. But if uh, you have any questions about the service itself or if you'd like to learn more about it on your own time, you're welcome to visit the uh, website that appears up there on the screen. Or you could email me directly at that email address near the bottom. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I was wondering, well, I'll ask you a few questions. And um, if anyone else that's watching wants to ask any questions as well, you can write them in the chat, you know, whether you're not watching on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll keep an eye out and try to ask your questions too. Um, but just to start off, um, you know, a lot of people in our community are filmmakers that also work, uh, you know, as freelancers. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the services that you offer that could be useful um, for freelancers. Yeah, definitely. So um, whether it's freelancers or other uh, private contractors, um, you know, uh, gig workers, uh, Uber and Lyft drivers come to mind, individuals with inconsistent incomes. I think our services uh, are especially beneficial insofar as it lets them um, apply some level of order and organization to an otherwise unruly uh, sort of financial situation. So um, we understand that income could be inconsistent and um, hard to pin down on a week to week or monthly basis, but Recognizing that, uh, what we often try to do is start looking at the other end of that equation. If we can't necessarily pin down what our income is uh, very, you know, very uh, accurately or reliably, then we could at least look at what we seem to be using whatever money we do have available on. What do, what do our purchases consist of? Uh, both the fixed expenses that don't change too drastically from one month to the next. Uh, your rent payment or your light bill or your cell phone bill, for example. But just as importantly, if not more so, is the discretionary spending, which we could also term our lifestyle spending or lifestyle choices. So depending on what a person's routine may consist of, they may spend more or less money on certain things or in certain places. By looking at our budget, by evaluating our transaction history, as I mentioned a little while ago, we can figure out what your lifestyle translates to in terms of the dollars you're spending. Then, you know, we can take a step back and start asking the right questions. Um, what part of my routine is indispensable? Which parts are not? Uh, which parts are essential to my well-being and my feeling good about what I'm doing with my, you know, my life on a day-to-day -day basis? And to what extent are these choices aligned with our stated goals, whether it's to save more money or get out of debt faster or uh, build up an emergency fund? Um, if, if these are the things we want to do, then obviously we want to put ourselves in the, in the best position to accomplish these goals. And even if we can't necessarily pin down what our income is going to be, then we can at least figure out by looking at the historical record, that is your transaction history, 
what our spending seems to consist of. If we can answer how much money we need, then we could hopefully begin to answer the question, well, what do I need to do in order to better manage the income I have now? Or it could lead to other bigger questions like, okay, uh, what am I willing to do in order to increase my income in, in the interim? What, what can I do to boost it somehow and make up for what appears to be an income shortfall if I don't seem to have enough money on hand to do the things I need to do? Um, but yeah, I, I guess it would, it would begin by just having a nice, honest look at what those numbers are. Um, are there any particular habits that you would encourage a freelancer to, um, you know, start, start doing to, uh, you know, be on that road to find yeah. flexibility? Well, I would say as, as tedious and as boring as it may seem to a creative, uh, it, it would be keeping a close eye on your spending. That that means looking at your checking account transaction history, for instance. If if you're the sort of person that makes most of your purchases using a debit card, then each one of those purchases is going to show up as an individual line item on your transaction history. Keep an eye on that uh, because that's going to keep you. It's going to lead to a greater awareness of what your money's doing. And after you do that, you're going to want to take it a step further. And I'm, I'm going to start getting into the weeds here. I won't spend too much time here. But once, you, once you're in the habit of evaluating your transaction history, you're going to want to try to use that information to start planning ahead. You want to start projecting into the future what expenses you can expect to come up, whether they're part of your routine and they're more of a personal choice or whether it's a bill that's unavoidable. That's what a cash flow analysis will hopefully allow you to do. Begin planning for these expenses. And the reason that's important is because it, under ideal circumstances, by projecting into the future and developing an idea of what you should begin to plan for in terms of setting aside money for certain things, you can avoid running into those situations where it seems as if suddenly the money you thought you'd have available for a certain thing isn't there. What happened? You know, like where did things go wrong? Um, moving forward, you could sort of answer that for yourself ahead of time by doing that cash flow analysis that uses previous transactions to figure out what might be recurring again in the future. And again, that would be another way to add some level of order, some level of stability to an otherwise uncertain and unstable sort of financial situation. Are there any uh, common financial mistakes that you see creative uh, freelancers typically make? Um, you know, I I don't I don't want to single out creatives. I, I, I think creatives are are human beings like anybody else. I think uh, we, we all make the common mistake of you know going going with the flow, uh, going with the flow even if it isn't necessarily um, the the financially prudent thing to do. Um, so what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, I think the, the, the past year has been especially, uh, taxing for, for many of us, uh, but even under normal circumstances, um, life can be a bit of a grind. And sometimes, um, the choices that we make with our money can be can be viewed as self-care, can, can be viewed as enriching somehow. And that, is, that may very well be true. Um, but to assume that some of these financial choices are always self-care can get in the way of the sort of introspection and um, self-evaluation that might actually lead you to implement the sort of changes that would further your long-term goals. So
So I guess that's just a really roundabout roundabout way of saying instant gratification can get in the way of sound financial choices. And that's really human. I I deal with it. My friends deal with it. My family deals with it. Uh, it's something we all do. So um, I, I think that would be that would be a common mistake. But I don't think it's isolated to the creative community. Yeah, I guess in that vein, um, do you have any advice for um, someone that might need to make those like hard decisions of prioritizing expenses? I, you know, my style of coaching uh, can be pretty Socratic in the sense that it, it often leads with questions. Hmm. Um, you want to start asking the right questions. Uh, where do you want to see yourself financially? And why? Why Why is that financial destination important? If If you could start anchoring all of these different... Uh, decisions that we're trying to navigate in something personally meaningful, then you'll be motivated to stick with the process, whether whether it's meeting with me or one of my fellow coaches or following through with whatever recommendations we may extend to you. Um, you should start by asking yourself, why is this important? Um, and why is having money for a certain thing important. Um, it, it may seem like child's play, but it's these are important questions. And it's easy to get distracted or become discouraged if we don't have a clear sense of where the destination is, you know, where this journey is headed. Um, yeah, I, I hope that somebody answers your question. No, it does. Um, you also mentioned, you know, the pandemic and how this year has been you know, especially rough and, you know, especially for on top of that, especially for freelancers, you know, they bore the brunt of a lot of um, what happened with the economy this past year. Um, and as a result, you know, the government has um, invested in different programs to rebuild um, that rebuild that economy. Can you talk a little bit about the um, different opportunities that uh, freelancers might be um, eligible for? Sure. Sure. So I'll start with uh, one that most people might be familiar with, and that's uh, unemployment insurance. So uh, individuals can apply for unemployment insurance benefits uh, with their state's Department of Labor. And oftentimes in the past, freelancers, gig workers, private contractors have gotten the short end of the stick just because of existing policy. Uh, they they may not have qualified because they didn't have sufficient work history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the midst of the pandemic, a a new unemployment assistance program, uh, one that's adjacent to the traditional uh, unemployment insurance system, was unveiled to help non-traditional applicants. So even if you would normally not qualify for unemployment insurance benefits, with PUA or pandemic unemployment assistance, you would qualify. And that would be one way to supplement, um, you know, an, an impacted income to supplement uh, a reduced income uh, as a result of the pandemic. In addition to that, there have been, there have been other programs that were implemented to help small business owners overall. Initially, uh, there was some confusion uh, in the messaging and the Paycheck Protection Program was not necessarily marketed as something that private contractors or freelancers would be eligible for. Um, since it was unveiled back in 2020, the messaging has changed, it's been clarified, and now we understand that private contractors are eligible for this program. Um, there is a process for applying, and unfortunately, uh, the deadline was scheduled for the end of this month. On top of that, it, uh, according to uh, a recent announcement by the Small Business Administration, the program has essentially ran out of money. Having said that, uh, they also said that there is still some amount of limited funding left 
for what what are called community development financial institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, these are these are essentially local banks, uh, credit unions, for instance, or other forms of uh, community focused financial institutions uh, through which uh, traditionally underserved individuals can apply for some of these funds. So that means women, it means minorities, people of color, traditionally underserved populations, including artists. So although the chances of getting a loan are, are certainly reduced, um, if somebody has the bandwidth and the time to gather the necessary documentation and submit an application, it may be worth a shot. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program could get you uh, two and a half times whatever your gross monthly income may have been. Um, and, and that could be determined through your tax filings. So if you, if you filed 2019, 2020 taxes, um, it's those numbers that would be used to determine how much money you could get from the PPP program. And I, I could go into more detail, but your your eyes would glaze over and it's definitely yeah. the sort of thing that it might be better to really dive into during a one-on-one -on -one session. Sure. Um, can I ask one clarifying question? Yes. The um, limited funding that um, it, that they said is is available as part of this PPP program, that's mm -hmm. for people that um, have services that benefit underrepresented communities. No, no. Uh, great question. No. Uh, to clarify, uh, these CDFIs, these community development financial institutions, they are in the business of mm -hmm. serving underserved communities. So it's it's for those populations that whatever may remain of the PPP funds are being res reserved for. Got it. So there's still a certain amount of money, 16, 18 billion or so. That, that's been set aside for these institutions in particular. So although the official announcement is we've ran out of money, you know, there's a side note that says, but these financial institutions may still have some money available for certain right. individuals. Yeah. Got it. That's really helpful. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of making goals with the client? Um, what kind of goals would you say, uh, I, I know it surely depends on person to person, but um, I guess specifically making sure that people make realistic financial goals for themselves. Well, uh, you, you know, I think distilling goals of any sort uh, begins just by ar articulating them. Um, it can be realistic or not. Um, I, I would, you know, I don't, I don't think any of our I don't think any coach's instinct is to, uh, you know, like push back or poo-poo a goal, uh, regardless of how unrealistic or not it may seem at first. We'll we'll just ask questions. Um, if somebody wants to be a homeowner, um, we'll ask, how soon would you like to be a homeowner? Um, where would you like to buy? Um, how how big of a house? Um, you know, and then those questions start giving us some ballparks to work with. If uh, the goal can be time bound, um, it'll be that much easier to figure out what steps we should begin taking today in order to get to a down payment by a certain date in the future. Uh, that would be one example. Um, another goal may be to pay down debt more effectively. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, Some people wanna get out of debt overnight. Um, we would have to first evaluate their credit report and break down what all of these different records mean, um, what the credit card balances mean, um, and how quickly or not they can be paid down with the income they have at their disposal today. So, you know, we'll begin by hearing out the goal and then doing our best to align our recommendations with that goal, even if it means adjusting the timeline somewhat. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think when it comes to being realistic, uh, one, one area of friction 
would be how how quickly uh, some of these goals can be attained, uh, can, can be reached. Yeah, thank you. So we have a, a few questions here. Um, one is about um, LLCs. Very often um, filmmakers, I'm, I'm sure freelancers in general too, um, will create a LLC to, um, you know, accept money specifically for projects or to receive grant funds. Um, can you talk a little bit about the benefits um, of uh, making an LLC? And at what point um, will you begin to owe, owe taxes? That is a great question. And uh, I, I wish I'd mentioned this at the outset. Uh, so there are certain areas that we're not specialized to offer mm -hmm. much guidance on, or, or at least, uh, not guidance that's especially sophisticated. So uh, we're not tax specialists, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, we're also not lawyers. So I wouldn't be able to offer you uh, much legal advice or tax advice. Um, for that sort of thing, I, I think I'd probably defer to a tax specialist, uh, perhaps somebody who works with the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Service, also known as a VITA site. Uh, volunteer income tax assistance. Uh, these are tax preparation services that are offered pro bono um, by various uh, nonprofit and community-based organizations across the country. Uh, the IRS has a locator tool that can be used to find one in the area. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish I could offer you more, you know, some some more insight there. But we're not business specialists or tax. <laughs> I know um, the LLC, everything around taxes is, is very confusing. Um, when we had an accountant at my pre a previous job, they also <laughs> struggled giving that kind of tax advice because I know it is, um, it, yeah, it can get quite confusing. Um, could you um, talk a little bit about, um, I guess, like, Many filmmakers struggle with debt. Um, you know, film school can be very expensive. Uh, could you talk about um, like different strategies that you have for uh, paying off student loan debt and how worried people should be about it? Um, for example, like if they receive some extra money, like, you know, should that, how much of that should go towards savings or investments versus, you know, going immediately to pay off any debt that they might have incurred? Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say that generally speaking, you, you want to balance your immediate budgetary needs with a very legitimate desire and interest in saving as much money uh, as possible in interest fees and interest charges. Um, we're currently in the midst of a deferment period. Um, most federal student loans have had their payments deferred through the end of September. And that means that although you might, although students may normally have to make a payment, those payments have been zeroed out, no payments are due. However, when that deferment period ends and, and things return to normal, interest will likely begin accruing. On, on many of these student loans. And that is a very good reason. Uh, it, it's a good incentive to try to pay them off sooner than later. So one tip to minimize the amount of money that one may have to pay in interest charges is to begin making payments as soon as humanly possible, um, if, if one has the ability to do so. So that means making payments on a loan almost as soon as you get it, if it's something that you can do. If not, then begin making payments as soon as you can by getting enrolled in an income-based repayment plan, uh, which would set your monthly payment um, at a number that is hopefully affordable since it would be based on what your income may be at the time you apply. Uh, beyond that, uh, provided we agree that getting out of school student loan debt sooner than later um, would be the better thing to do, would be the better outcome, then we would again go back to the budget, figure out how much money we could conceivably set aside for a bigger debt payment, and then consistently 
make those more aggressive debt payments in order to pay down the debt faster. Um, it's it's worth the effort, I believe, uh, since student loan debt can quickly grow due to the interest charges. Um, and if you could avoid that, then you'll be you'll be in a much better financial position uh, over the long haul. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice on, I guess, like the minimum amount you would encourage a freelancer to have saved? You know, especially since um, you know they're dealing with an inconsistent income. Yeah, so that's uh, it depends, right? It, it depends on the person. Um, I sound like a broken record, but I, I would go back to the budget, uh, use it to evaluate what their essential expenses consist of, their living expenses, the bills that they need to you know, operate in a modern world, internet, Wi-Fi, cell phone. Um, uh, you know, if they have a car, whatever their car payment may be, if they need to get around and they have a vehicle, you know, there, there are certain essential expenses that can't be done away with. So we identify what those add up to on a monthly basis and then use that as a baseline for how much one should save to get by in a month when they're unemployed. And then we can just extrapolate, um, you know, two, three months or more in emergency savings. Personally, um, I recommend having anywhere from three to six months worth of emergency savings once we figure out what those essential expenses consist of on a monthly basis. Um, but since it depends on the individual, it's it's hard to give, uh, you know, a, a, a universal figure. It, it it really depends on the person. Yeah, that's helpful though, giving the the different um, times. Yeah, <laughs> times that you should have saved for. Um, we have another question coming in here. Uh, do you have any tips on how to quickly raise the credit score? Quickly. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I I try to be very careful. All right. Uh, when it comes to credit and debt questions. Um. I, I don't want to just issue a blanket recommendation to pay off your debt as quickly as possible because um, that could lead to hasty decisions in, in and of themselves. So for instance, I wouldn't recommend emptying out your savings in order to pay off all of your debt overnight. However, if we have a certain sum of money available to pay off our debt more aggressively and using it wouldn't put us in a financially precarious position, assuming these, you know, these are the conditions we're, we're working under, then you could tackle it this way. If you have high balances, balances that exceed 30% of whatever the account's limit might be, then you would want to try to pay your balances to something under that threshold. So something under than 30% of your limit. As an example, if you have a credit card that has a thousand dollar limit, then 30% of that limit would be 300. If you have a balance on that account that exceeds 300, then paying it to an amount that's under 300 or even better if it's zero, that would improve your credit standing pretty quickly because when you have elevated balances, uh, balances that exceed that 30% threshold, it sends a certain message about that particular consumer to the credit reporting bureaus and by extension, whomever is using those credit reports to evaluate your credit worthiness. The message it's sending is this person is either unwilling or unable to manage their debt effectively. That's the only reason they would have such elevated balances month after month after month. And so when when we have elevated balances, um, you're you're going to see a decline in your score um, up until you begin to pay those balances down and preferably below thirty percent of whatever that limit is. So that would be one tip. Another tip would be if you come across any any collection accounts, 
uh, any collection accounts that may be dragging down your score. Uh, a collection account, by the way, is when one, for whatever reason, stops making payments on a credit card, as an example. That credit card issuer could eventually write off that account as a tax loss so that they can pay less in taxes. And eventually that could be sold off to a whole different company, a collection company, which could employ all sorts of nasty tactics to force you to pay. Sometimes these collection companies screw up their record keeping and they honestly have no idea what they're reporting. It could be an error. If that error is appearing on your credit report, it's also dragging down your score. By disputing that error, by investigating it and possibly getting it removed, again, you would quickly improve your credit score. So th those are a couple of tips uh, for, for how somebody could rapidly improve their credit standing. Yeah, that's really helpful. Could you talk a little bit about what a session with a financial coach looks like? You know, what you guys talk about um, and also, you know, how often you meet? Sure. Um, so the financial coaching sessions can be uh, conducted over the phone or over video chat. Uh, often, generally speaking, the first session is scheduled for 30 minutes. But oftentimes after we've had that initial conversation, kind of, uh, you know, develop the picture of what our client's needs might be and what their uh, what their challenges are, we may set aside uh, 60 minutes for a longer follow up session where we'll delve into some of the specifics that we only just started to unpack during that first call. Uh, we'll talk about we'll, we'll talk about their financial goals. Uh, we'll talk about what they perceive as their biggest challenge. And then we'll we'll get into the weeds about what those challenges actually are. Um, I'll, I'll try to use a practical example. So, uh, yeah, let's say a freelancer wants to save more money for emergencies. Um, they have a certain amount of money coming in every month uh, be, because they haven't starved to death. Um, so their money is coming from somewhere. But for some reason, they haven't quite gotten a handle on their family on their finances in a way that would enable them to set aside even a small portion of money on a regular basis. So we'll ask, we'll ask uh, what they typically spend their money on by, by going through a budget. Uh, maybe, maybe not during that first phone call, uh, but it would eventually come up so that we have a, we have a clearer and better understanding of, what the challenges that they have some sense of actually boil down to in terms of the dollars that are being spent. Um, they might identify a challenge as, I can't seem to find a way to avoid ordering delivery uh, three times a week. Okay, so one, if, if if the idea would be to avoid that particular expense because they've identified it as an obstacle, they're overspending on that one thing, then we would look at how that could be avoided. Maybe it means switching our routine in such a way that allows us the time and the bandwidth to meal prep, cook more meals at home in order to avoid buying prepared meals, which are generally more expensive outside. Um, a practical change that would hopefully lead to real savings, which would enable them to build their emergency savings. That, as one example. Are there any success stories that you'd like to share? Um, you know, maybe specifically about like a freelancer uh, who was able to change their financial situation, you know, due to, um, you know, changing some of their habits with a financial coach? Sure. Sure. Um, one client comes to mind. I believe she was a hair stylist from New York. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, her income was definitely impacted as uh, she started to see fewer and fewer clients. Uh, over the course of our uh, coaching relationship, I I helped this person 
secure unemployment benefits. Um, I help them navigate uh, a fairly frustrating system uh, that that had many shortcomings and all sorts of like unreasonable wait times. But uh, you know, we we stuck together. I, I helped her uh, navigate things like gathering the necessary documents and uh, responding to requests for additional documentation. And eventually, we we got her the benefits she needed. Once we secured those benefits, um, we made sure that she was leveraging them in such a way that allowed her to build up a certain safety net um, that that would help her weather this financial uh, storm. And we we built up her savings, uh, allowed her to transition from underemployment back to something along the lines of full employment without getting into too much debt. Um, you know, if if we hadn't intervened, um, she may have found herself in a position where she would have had to go into debt. She would have had to put purchases on credit cards and not just frivolous purchases, but living expenses, um, groceries and and, you know, fixed expense bills uh, would have had to been placed on credit cards, which would have created this mounting debt which she would have eventually had to deal with um, once things got back to normal, or or even sooner if she ran up her, her limits and she eventually ran out of available credit. By, by methodically managing the income that we helped her obtain, we avoided that scenario. And now she's, you know, back to work, uh, she's debt free and she's slowly uh, rebuilding her finances um, and she doesn't have the drag of these monthly debt payments that might have otherwise been there and prevented her from, you know, returning to normal and, and getting back on the path to her larger financial goals. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I imagine some people in our audience uh, are really excited by uh, your offer to uh, provide a free financial coaching. Could you talk a little bit about you know that process of how um, they would get started? Sure. So you can sign up uh, using a link that I believe might have been. Let me see here. Just want to double check. Okay, so in this case, uh, since we're doing a little, uh, since we're doing something a bit differently with CERN, I think uh, anybody who's interested in signing up can reach out to me directly and I'll pull whatever necessary strings need to be pulled in order to get them enrolled in the service. Um, once you enroll, uh, you provide us with uh, information to fill up uh, your profile, basic info, first, last name, your address. And if you would also like to discuss your credit, then you'd be asked to provide credit authorization for that TransUnion credit report. And as with most credit related things, it would involve your social security number, just to be clear. Um, once you sign up for the service, you schedule a session with uh, the coach of your choice. If you prefer somebody who's English speaking, you could choose somebody who's English speaking or somebody who's Spanish speaking if you prefer a Spanish speaker. Uh, the, ses the session is scheduled. You choose whether or not you want it to be a phone or a video chat, and you get started at the scheduled time. Um, you begin meeting with your coach, explain what your goals are, and he or she will help you clarify the goal if it needs some additional clarification, and then develop a strategy. Uh, to develop a strategy that's tailor made and practical, um, not some sort of, you know, abstract pie in the sky sort of thing. We, we want to give you actionable things to work on in order to get the ball rolling and, and get you closer to your financial goals. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, Chris. Um, I really believe in the work that you guys are doing. It's um, 
so important and so helpful. Uh, so thank you for talking with us a little bit. Um, to everyone that joined, thank you so much. Um, if you're interested in this kinds of these kinds of conversations, please follow us. We also do um, discussions on grant funding, um, skill building, master classes, um, among many other things. So um, please follow um, the work that we do. And again, thank you so much, Chris. My pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Have a good night.